Margaret Atwood was 60 when she first won the Booker Prize for her novel The Blind Assassin in the year 2000. In some ways people have seen it as strange that this is a novel that did it for her. It wasn't her breakout novel by any means and it hasn't had as long a lasting legacy as The Handmaid's Tale. For some people it gives big Scorsese winning best director for The Departed vibes. Like yes they probably deserve it for their creative output throughout their career but was this really the peak of their work? Some people are kind of skeptical. For example, the New York Times described it as overlong and badly written. I think that's kind of unfair, personally. The Blind Assassin, for me, is Atwood at her most narratively tricksy. She toys with you as a reader and leaves you with more questions than you came in with, all whilst delivering a story that is rich with thematic content. My name's Eddie, this is my series on Atwood's major works, let's go. So The Blind Assassin is kind of told to us in a split narrative form. Roughly half our story is told to us by Iris, an octogenarian who is recounting to us her life growing up in Ticonderoga, Canada with her younger sister, Laura. Laura, at some point in the future, has died either by suicide or accident in which her car went off the side of a bridge. The other half of the novel is dedicated to Laura's novel within the novel, The Blind Assassin. The cult runaway success, this is the story of an unnamed protagonist who's having an affair with a pulp science fiction writer in seedy hotels and back rooms. In Iris's half of the story, she first recounts to us the history of the small town in which she grew up in and her grandparents' legacy as only a button factory there. Her grandparents also founded Avilion, the house in which she and her sister Laura grew up. By their father's time, the Chase family are firmly ingrained into the life of the community. They are a job provider, they run local events, and Norval Chase, her father, provides jobs to veterans from World War I who he sees as underappreciated by their country. Their mother dies when Iris is nine and their father kind of takes up drink and uh, becomes romantically involved with an artsy type. It's through her that Laura and Iris meet Alex Thomas at kind of a, a local festival picnic. A picture is taken of the three of them in the local paper in which Alex kind of reaches out his hand to block half the camera with the girls on either side of him. Alex is a political leftist and Laura is seen meeting with him several times over the next year, though she insists that when she is seen with him, it's only because she's trying to save his soul. It's worth saying that Laura is a bit of an unusual child. She has strange ideas about religion. She frequently questions authority and has a kind of habit for tinting over the faces of different people in family photos in order to show their true essence. You know, standard childhood behaviour. Uh, eventually workers start agitation at the factories. Norval is very disappointed at this because he's always seen it as, you know, I'm one of the good guys. I'm providing jobs for my community. We're, we're all in this together, lads. The Great Depression makes the workers realise that, you know, maybe their interests and his interests don't quite align all the time. The factories eventually start to be shut down. A warrant is part of Alex Thomas's arrest and Laura manages to sneak him into the family attic. At this point, Alex makes a pass at Iris. Uh, she is concerned that he might be doing the same to her sister. They eventually manage to sneak him away, uh, but he leaves behind him a long list of unintelligible words that they think, you know, maybe some kind of code. Norval increasingly starts having business dinners with his uh, business rival from a nearby town, uh, Richard of the Griffin family. <laughs> Richard of the Griffin family makes it sound like I'm talking about some fantasy character. Iris is invited along to all of these meals and is eventually surprised to find out that Richard wants to marry her. She's convinced to say yes by her father with the knowledge that this might be the only way they can save their factories. They marry and embark on a rather uncomfortable Honeymoon, it must be said. <laughs> Richard's sister, Winifred, who accompanies them on this trip, and we've already seen in the future, is uh, an antagonistic presence for Iris, who's keeping her granddaughter from her. She's controlling and rules Richard's household with an iron fist and is very jealous of his attention. Richard controls every facet of Iris's life and goes so far as to keep the news of her father's death from her. She only finds out when they return to Canada and Laura calls her in like a deluge of tears. It turns out that Richard reneged on his promise to save her father's factories, so he drank himself to death. Great start to a marriage, really. The Blind Assassin, the novel within a novel, tells a different story. Story. In it, an unnamed woman, presumably Laura, has an affair with an unnamed man who is presumed to be Alex Thomas. He's a working class man involved in politics. He amuses her with science fiction stories of a fictionalised planet called Zykron in which young women are sacrificed to appease the gods and their tongues are removed to prevent them from 
complaining and protesting about it. A young boy who has been blinded to be a carpet maker, but then uh, tossed out to be an assassin, is sent to kill her, but instead decides to rescue her and the two escape together. The two characters disagree on how to end the story. The male character has them consumed by wolves. The female character has them escape to the hills where they're rescued by a group of women whose society has outcast as it's deemed them as mad. Eventually, the male character heads off to fight in the Spanish Civil War on the Republican side. Meanwhile, back in Iris's recounting, Laura has come to live with the newly formed Griffin family, but has been acting out. Richard takes a particular interest in her, Laura and Richard go out sailing together and he lets her quit school. Both sisters run into Alex Thomas at different times during this period. Eventually Iris becomes pregnant. She's shocked to find out that Laura has been institutionalized by Richard and Winifred. Laura is insisting that not only is she pregnant but that Iris is carrying her baby. In the meantime in The Blind Assassin the main character receives a telegram that her lover has died in the Second World War. Laura escapes one day from the institution. After the war, the two sisters meet. It's revealed that Laura was in fact pregnant at the time, uh, but not with Alex Thomas's baby, but with the baby of Richard, who has been assaulting her for a number of years. She said that she sacrificed herself in order to save Alex Thomas after Richard threatened her get him arrested. Iris, in a moment of absolute cruelty, reveals that not only is Alex Thomas dead, but that she had been Alex Thomas's lover. Laura drives off a bridge uh, the next day. Finally, as astute readers will have picked up quite a while ago, uh, The Blind Assassin is revealed to not have been written by Laura, but by Iris. She wrote it as a retaliation against Richard, who subsequently kills himself at the thought that Laura might have been in love with another man. Iris reveals that she's writing this story as a kind of message to Sabrina, uh, with the hope that she'll read it and find out what her true parentage is, what her true backstory is. She dreams that Sabrina will come to her and, and knock on her door, uh, but we find out that this doesn't happen and get the obituary of Iris. Tricky one, I think. Apologies if my voice gets a bit croaky. I was at the Mitski concert last night, so there was some loud singing. Of the novels that we've looked at in this series so far, this one is the one with the most layers to it. It's fascinating to me that the majority of this novel is told to us by the same authorial voice at different points in her life, but we're not aware of this until you know, towards the end of the novel. In that sense, Iris is a character who is playing with the reader, presumably Sabrina, throughout this novel, trying to will her to find out the truth of this narrative whilst presenting it in chronological order. And yet several aspects of both of the parts of this novel, um, to me, mean that you can't see the blind assassin as a straightforward story with a plot twist that reveals all. That's not really what's going on here in my opinion. To start with the thematic content that we do know, Outward returns to some of her authorial preoccupations in this story. Iris and Laura are clearly trapped in and defined by the society in which they have been raised. Both characters are born into wealth, uh, and due to that, are themselves turned into a kind of commodity, which is to be bought and traded. They have various tutors throughout their childhood, but when they fail to be educated by them, it is barely seen as an issue. Their education is seen as secondary to the purpose of their life. Iris, barely an adult, is forced to marry a man who she hardly knows to prop up her father's business. Likewise, Richard only treats her well when she is able to provide him things that he wants. His abuse of her is only stopping when she becomes pregnant. Class is another central theme of this novel. Norval's belief that he's a good man and provider for his community uh, really is shown to be a lie when push comes to shove. Likewise, Iris's depiction of Alex is someone who is constantly, uh, you know, putting in barbs against her because of her class status. And the two of them are both aware that because of this class divide, it's very unlikely they're ever gonna run away together. This is in sharp contrast to the Sakyul Norn element of the story in which the blind assassin and the maiden do run away together, they do trust each other. But arrogance of the wealthy is also highlighted in this novel. Richard's political career is basically based on praising Hitler. <laughs> really picked the right horse to bet on there, mate. But he is more measured on Mussolini, so, you know. There's that. So I know this isn't really relevant to the rest of the video, but I'm going to chuck it in here anyway. Margaret Ann Doody argues that the button was chosen as the source of the Chase family's wealth because people have suggested that it's the small, trivial, rather ridiculous object that is the source of the Newsom's family's wealth in 
The Ambassadors by Henry James. Now this led me into a deep dive on this. Ian e. Forster is the one that said button hooks might potentially have been this object. Some people say it was a chamber pot, but that's too on the nose in my opinion. Slate say that they found the answer, and they think the answer was the toothpick, though um, I don't necessarily buy that a toothpick would have been seen as vulgar at the time, but then again with a button. All this to say I am incapable of researching for a video without going on a completely pointless tangent for hours. I didn't even like The Ambassadors that much. <laughs> it wasn't a very good book. In any case, buttons repeatedly pop up in the narrative of the blind assassin, usually as a kind of symbol of holding something that is loved together. But the smallness and the flimsiness of buttons kind of shows how precarious keeping things that you love together is. I think The Blind Assassin is a lot of fun to thematically analyse, simply for the way it doesn't make it easy for you. As I've said, readers who are closely paying attention to the novel will probably figure out quite quickly that Iris is the one that wrote The Blind Assassin. However, I think it would be a mistake to take any part of this novel, including Iris's sections or The Blind Assassin, at face value. In both stories, there are elements that are obfuscating for the reader. Not only that, but Iris admits this. For example, when talking about her husband, she says, I fail to convey Richard in any rounded sense. He remains a cardboard cutout. I know that. I can't truly describe him. I can't get a precise focus. He's blurred, like the face of some wet, discarded newspaper. Memory is not an exact thing, as Iris admits in the narrative, but it is also something that you can manipulate the blurriness of in order to justify yourself and your own actions. Do you really believe that Iris was unable to see what was happening to Laura in her own household? Similar to the way that Grace and alias Grace uh, manipulated the narrative for Dr. Simon Jordan, we can see that Iris is purposely adjusting her narrative for her specific reader, who we find out is Sabrina in the latter half of the novel. Like one big question is, do we honestly believe that Iris wasn't aware of the way her words would impact on Laura when she told her about Alex Thomas. It was a cruel and vindictive way to talk to her sister who she knew was in love with this man. I don't get the impression that Iris is always the nicest of people. Likewise, we should never forget when reading the blind assassin part of a novel for this is a work of fiction. It's a novel that Iris has written. Yeah, it appears this story is not simply a true to life retelling of Iris' romantic affair with Alex Thomas. Yes, multiple times it's referenced in The Blind Assassin things that we know happened to Iris, whether she was going off to the Queen Mary or when she was receiving the telegram of Alex's death. Likewise, the Marxist science fiction stories that Alex Thomas uh, writes in the narrative don't hugely seem out of character for him, based on what Iris tells us. The science fiction story itself is a whole lot of fun. The King of Sakyal Nor is clearly based on Richard. He plans to sell his mistress into slavery because you know, why not? Everything is for sale. The sacrificial maiden for the slaughter can clearly be tied into either Laura or Iris. And the blind assassin is a character who fails in his duty in the same way that Alex is arguably failing in his duty by falling in love with a rich woman. Yeah, the narrative aligns with everything that we see of Alex in Iris's narrative, but we gotta bear in mind that we only ever see him through her lens in both stories. And the prologue and the epilogue demonstrate why the blind assassin the novel can't be seen as a true recounting of life. In each, the picture of Alex Thomas at the picnic is described, but what we actually get is the two different versions of the picture that Laura provided to Iris. The photo is kind of cut in half in different ways. We get one photo with Laura and Alex, and we get one photo of Iris and Alex that has been cut in half. Are we then to see the blind assassin not just as Iris's relationship with him, but also as an amalgamation with what Laura's relationship with Alex Thomas could have been, should have been, kind of Iris's guilt over this situation. And moreover, is Iris attributing this story to Laura kind of a way to assuage her guilt, to, to give her a legacy after her death? Or is it simply a means of revenge against Richard? And if it was an attack on him, why has she left the story so implicit rather than explicit? I'm aware that what I've been doing in talking about this novel is mainly just asking questions. <laughs> Great analysis, mate. I'm going to subscribe to this channel for sure. He, you know, he's really good at not analysing anything. Legitimately, this is a novel which defies clear interpretation, and if you think that you have an 100% clear interpretation of this novel, first of all, I envy your confidence, but second of all, I think you might want to take a further look at it. I actually really like The Blind Assassin for its lack of easy answers. I enjoy the ambiguity of this novel, and if you've come away from this video less sure than when you came in, entirely to be expected, and I'm sorry. Subscribe and join us next time for uh, Oryx and Crake, the first of the Mad Adam series of novels, which I am hyped for. I love you and leave you. See you next time. Goodbye.